Okay, good afternoon. I hope you had a restful, exciting Labor Day weekend. This is week two of this class, CCS 325 on Automobile and Society. If you're new to the class, if you just added, or if this is your first day, make sure that you know where the class material can be found. There is an announcement on Brightspace and otherwise you can simply use the shortcut andreafedi.com, my first and last name, my personal domain, andreafedi.com slash CCS325. Or you can come and see me after the class and ask questions, get some information. You know that in this class, we focus on the representation of the automobile as both a modern technology modern in the sense in a sense that we understand that is to say a technology that goes or appears to go beyond its utilitarian function to represent or perform so much more for its users or owners and we focus mostly on the first 10, 15 years of the 20th century, because that is when the automobile was perfected, was mass produced. It went finally from being a wealthy people's toy, a pastime for the rich and famous. For example, if you go to and visit the Mercedes-Benz Automobile Museum in Stuttgart. You start from the top floor and you go down in your itinerary and everything is organized chronologically. The first thing you see at the beginning of your itinerary, it's a uh, giant model, a one-to-one -one model of a horse with a writing underneath that reports a famous statement by the Emperor of Germany saying, the automobile is a fad. The horse is going to stay. The automobile will pass. So we will focus on the period, the documents, some of the silent films from the early 19th, 19th century where the automobile became what we still at least in part, think of it. Before we get to it, we are going to look both at the history before the automobile of transportation and mobility related technologies. And on Thursday, we're going also to look at the future of the automobile. What is the future for this product? which, according to one of the readings that was assigned, has plateaued or maybe, in fact, in a state of decline. There are two presentations that I'm going to use today. One is called Before the Automobile. The other focuses on energy sources, technologies related to work, and transportation from past civilizations so that we have some ideas. We're not going to go into many technical details. So that's the focus of today. On Thursday, I will talk about the future of the automobile. We will devote one more session to the film, The Love Bug on Herbie, the sentient uh, Volkswagen Beetle, 1963 Volkswagen Beetle. And keep in mind that the first written assignment is due Friday of this week. And uh, I, I can answer questions now. I'll talk more about the assignment on Thursday to make sure that you understand the instructions. Of course, being the first assignment, if there is any misunderstanding, I'm willing to be flexible. We'll start with 
a statement from Enzo Ferrari, the founder of the Ferrari factory and brand, which is one, not only one of the most famous, but one of the most valuable brands in the industry. And Ferrari, who was really in love with the automobile, the automobiles were his whole life. He was an orphan orphan, meaning that he lost his father when he was young and sold his family home to buy an automobile and race. He was a race car driver also, not very successful, became much more successful in the 1920s and 30s as manager of the Alfa Romeo Scuderia. That was his first Scuderia. In order to manage that team, the official team, he had to sign a non-compete agreement. And that's why he had to wait until 1948 to produce a car with his name on it. Although he was already active as an industrialist, for example, during World War II, he was forced by the Germans after the Germans occupied Northern Italy in 1943 to produce spare parts for military vehicles and the Italian partisans had him on a list of people to kill, although that never happened. So what did he have to say about the origins of the automobile? He said, everything starts with a wheel. And he used to say, even though we don't know who invented the wheel, we can guess how it happened. Because if you look at nature, there are plenty of flowers and other plants that roll and therefore people from ancient times must have observed that phenomenon and reproduced it with the will. It's a bit of simplification, right? Because there is no wheel without axles, right? It's the combination of will and axle, as we will see in a moment, that really makes it possible for the wheel to be used to transport humans or products of any kind. It's that kind of basic machine that we have to look at. We know that by the year 2500 BC, and probably much sooner, the wheel and axle invention had been applied to carts. And here, of course, we see a military cart from Mesopotamia pulled by a kind of ass that was present in uh, Asia. Okay. I was talking about basic machines. This is a definition that goes back to the Renaissance. The Renaissance was into technology. They also studied and retrieved from uh, archives a lot of texts from antiquity, especially Latin and Greek texts. And there they found plenty of references to technologies of the past. And through their own observations and the study of those technical texts from the Greek and Roman civilizations, they came up with this interesting group called the basic machines. And this idea that all complex machinery is based on a combination of these, of some of these basic machines. Uh, in, within this view of technology, a simple machine is a machine that produces an advantage. That is to say that amplifies or makes it more efficient to apply the application of force, of energy, right? So you have a multiplication of energy or that energy is redirected. And once you change the, direct, the direction of energy, then you get some advantages in terms of the way you can handle this machine 
and whatever is connected to it. And you find the six uh, basic machines. I also linked an article from Wikipedia just so that you have a basic idea if you want. Of course, you have the most basic, the lever. You have a wheel and axle, and I like the fact that they didn't put a cart in here because wheel and axles cannot be find, found just inside carriages. For example, in this case, you can see that you find a wheel and axle also for a well, right? To move up and down a bucket and bring up the water. The pulley is another great example of a basic machine. And even inside the pulley, you find a wheel and axle if you look at it, right? You have a wheel that spins around an axle. You have the inclined plane, plane and in fact, Last week we talked about trains and I mentioned passingly how rails were invented and used in England and other places long before trains were introduced. And it was found advantageous to use inclined planes with rails <coughs> to go on a steep hill or incline. The wedge is another simple machine and the screw as well, right? Which has this incredible ability to lock uh, and, and move things in different ways. In terms of the invention of the machine, you often find this popular idea that the, the automobile was one of many inventions of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci himself, a great famous representative of the Renaissance that we mentioned before, because Renaissance scholars came up with the idea of simple machines and there were plenty of engineers. Now, this is a misconception, I'm sorry to say, the same way that you cannot say that Leonardo invented the parachute or scuba diving apparatus, or the helicopter, uh, or the machine gun. For one thing, we know now, and this is a recent discovery, for example, most of the notebooks left by Leonardo were only uh, found in the early 1960s. And at that time, we didn't know much about engineering during the Middle Ages. Uh, we know now how since the end of the Middle Ages, the end of the 14th century, there were many engineers who traveled across Europe from different countries, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, and they usually carried with them a portfolio. They were moving from place to place wherever there would be someone, a wealthy patron, patron, politically powerful person or someone wealthy who would pay for their services. And they would show this portfolio, which included more or less the same inventions we or some attribute to Leonardo, the parachute, different apparatuses to go underwater, different kinds of flying machines, different kinds of weapons, similar in some way, in some ways to the modern machine gun or to the modern tank. But those were just PR material. That is to say, the engineer would say, this is what I could do for you. They were not blueprints. It's not like they could make a parachute. They were saying, this is an idea that I could realize with funding. And there were many details that were missing from any of those ideas to make them practicable, to make them, uh, to, to bring them to real life. Okay, so Leonardo's winged machine with, with a man Activating wings could not fly, clearly. Leonardo's helicopter could not fly with the material 
and with the amount of energy produced by spring or by cogwheels, and so on and so forth, and those were not original ideas. In the case of the purported automobile or self-propelled vehicle that you see here, there is a lot that we can appreciate. First of all, let me point out that everything we know about Leonardo's automobile, quote-unquote automobile, can be found on this illustration. Again, we don't have complete blueprints, and you can see that there are many parts that are missing. For example, there seems to be the option for directing the vehicle with a front wheel and a, a, a bar to steer the vehicle, but it's not fully uh, uh, drawn, right? In fact, even though you can find museums or touring exhibitions, one came to New York 10 or 15 years ago, with models of this, these models were made by modern engineers and modern engineers had to finish the alleged automobile by Leonardo. You can even find videos, you can buy a kit and make your own model about this big of Leonardo's automobile. And on YouTube, I produced, I included a link, you can find videos of this thing going around. Again, not enough was known about Leonardo until the middle of the 20th century. We've known more about Michelangelo, Raphael, other intellectuals and artists, but not so much about Leonardo's life. We know more about this now. We know that this so-called vehicle was made in 1478 for a theater performance. It was a religious drama of some sort. And at some point, probably in response to a request by a faithful or a saint, the Madonna, the Virgin Mary, had to appear on stage. Leonardo, who was well known since his youth for the production of toys, for example, Vasari in his life of Leonardo, tells us how Leonardo made a flying bird. And that's fine. You can use springs and cogwheels for a small flying birds, which you also saw, may have seen in a TV series about the Medici. So in this case, they went to Leonardo and they asked him to produce a machine on which a small statue of the Madonna, probably made just of plaster, so not something heavy, made of marble, something considerably light, would be placed on this machine as you can see, the machine has uh, uh, different kinds of cogwheels and springs, so you can load the springs. And then, when the time came for the so-called apparition on stage of the Madonna, this theatrical machine was activated simply by pulling a cord. The cord would release the locks on the springs and the machine advanced just a few feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, from backstage or from the side of the stage and to the center of the stage, and people would ah, gasp, right? And we know, again, that Leonardo did similar things. For example, Vasari himself, in the previously mentioned Vita of Leonardo, tells us how, after Leonardo moved to France, he made a lion, made of wood, with a mechanism inside that, once activated, could advance a few feet, moving closer to the King of France. Then, at that point, a secondary mechanism was activated by springs. The chest of the lion would open. But imagine the lion just on its hind feet, hind legs. And from the open chest, a bouquet of lilies came out because the lily was the symbol of the French monarchy. All simple things. So 
Is this the first automobile? It isn't. Is it a functioning self-propelled vehicle? Yes, it is, but nothing more than a toy and it could not really be scaled because there is only so much energy you can store inside the springs in here. And given the fact that this would be done with wood, even if you pick a light kind of wood, you have too much weight to send this kind of vehicle on, on an, over a distance of more than 10, 30, 50, let's say 100 feet. Again, not practical, right? You cannot imagine being on the road and having to load springs um, every time you go from here to the end of the classroom. So a theatrical prop and not really an automobile. So let's dispel the myth that Leonardo invented the automobile. The consensus is this is that this model, this is not the original, this is a model that you see here from a museum in Paris, can be considered the first self-propelled vehicle able to advance, driven by a crew of one or two over a substantial distance. As you can see, it's a tricycle. It's made of very hard, thick wood. It was made by a French engineer for the French army. The load on the back of this vehicle was supposed to be heavy artillery barrels, right? The heaviest part of artillery is the barrel itself, especially because in the past engineers were not so able we're not so good at calculating the resistance of the metal, so they made intentionally the artillery thicker to prevent the barrel from coming apart when the gunpowder exploded to propel the projectile out of it. And given that there is a lot of weight with the front tank and the engine, Whenever there is no artillery in the back, you have to place ballast. In this case, there are working models, a few of them, and you can see them or you can find them on YouTube. I, I included a couple of links. This vehicle could advance at a speed of between two and three miles. So it was not about speed, it was about efficiency, simply because in order to carry the same weight, you, have, you would have to have a carriage, and in front of it, you would have to have six, 10, 12 horses, right? In this case, in front, you have a steam engine. So uh, you don't sit, if, if, you, if you go around this model, then you would see the opening where you can load the coal. So the first part of this container is for the coal. The coal is ignited. Of course, the upper part of the container contains water. Of course, you have to wait some time for the water to boil and produce pressure. And the pressure of the steam produces the movement of these pistons that activate the front wheel. Two or three uh, of these carriages with a steam engine were produced between 1769, probably, and the following few years. According to tradition, one of them crashed into the wall, into a wall, which is understandable because clearly this thing is not easy to steer, given the weight uh, of, of the front apparatus. Although, if you think of the speed, it's kind of an Austin Power situation. And I don't know if you, you guys, you young guys know about Austin Powers, but there is this famous scene where uh, an actor is about to be hit by a vehicle 
which is a, a, a roller uh, uh, used to, to pave streets that is going at about a mile per hour. So it's just there saying, ah, 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 until it gets run over, but all oh, happens very slowly. So the speed is such that how can you avoid a wall? Anyway, not avoid a wall. Now, this is not a completely original invention, right? The steam engine applied to a carriage is one of those ideas that popped in different areas for sure. So the French example is one that we know enough about and we hear, we know that there were other attempts at this kind of vehicle in various areas of the world. We just don't have enough evidence about them. So for example, we know something about an experiment conducted in China with the help of a Jesuit missionary who put together local knowledge with imported knowledge to make some kind of steam engine vehicle. This is just an attempt of imagining the vehicle. It's not a reproduction. And you can see that it's very crude technologically. You have an open fire, which you don't want to have. Right? It, it's dangerous enough to have it in a closed container. You don't want to have an open fire on a moving vehicle. And you have a bowl for the water turning into steam. And the steam is turned into a wind, right? That is supposed to press on uh, the elements of this wheel. I don't think this is going to work really. It's going to generate some uh, um, propulsion, but is it enough to move the entire carriage? I don't know. But again, the important thing for you is to keep in mind that multiple places worked on the same idea, especially since the 17th century. Then during the 19th century, we know, we have evidence, we have illustrations, sometimes pictures, sometimes the original vehicle. Multiple tests were made for carriages without horses. You can find here the similarity with a traditional carriage, right? And it should be mentioned how carriages themselves, the carriages from the past became much more advanced starting from the 17th century. You, you can recognize the body of a carriage to uh, house the passengers. You can recognize the traditional seat of the coach. Only there is no uh, uh, group of horses in front. What you find is that in the back, there is a steam engine. And, and the idea of the giant wheel is just to give enough room to the steam engine to place it under, almost underneath the body of this. And then you have a rather small platform, I wouldn't like to be there, for a man who is supposed to add coal to uh, the steam engine and regulate the pressure. Again, this was made at least one prototype maybe two were made in London. This is from 1803. It was tested, it was taken around the streets, but it was a prototype. It was used mostly for testing. And uh, we know that the, well, tradition has it that uh, there was an accident, that the engine exploded. And there is a famous illustration of the explosion that basically makes fun of this. What kind of a cockamamie idea is this? It will never work. It's too dangerous and not very practical. This is just one of many, many examples. I've included another one made by a military engineer in Piedmont, Italy. And once again, you see a huge steam engine in the back with plenty of coal to move this vehicle for a long time. 
and the rest of it, the wheels, the suspensions, the body, the front seat, everything else is pretty much basic, traditional components for carriages. In this case, the original has survived and you can find it, it's beautiful, it's huge. You can find it in the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin. Uh, when you enter the museum, you find this. They also have this, this screen uh, showing the traditional carriage, big image with horses, and moving to this kind of vehicle. Now, better than the illustration from London, which we don't know how accurate might have been, in this case where we have an actual example, you can have a better idea of the great size of the steam engine component. Size and, of course, weight, right? So you need to balance this with enough passengers and crew in front. But you can also see that there is a basic issue of practicality when you have to attach such a big engine, which needs a crew, at least a crew of one, to feed the engine with coal, if not two, you see the lack of practicality of this idea. And, and therefore, even though you find plenty of prototypes in different places throughout the world, you don't find a series of these machines being made or operated for a long time. And in order to have the automobile even though steam will play a part in the history of the automobile, in order to have the automobile, you have to wait until first the internal combustion engine is invented. This is an Italian example from the 1850s. It might be the first invention of the uh, uh, internal combustion engine, but of course, it, it was an idea that was being worked on in different places. There is a museum in Lucca where you can see uh, Lucca being the place of one of the two inventors, Barsanti, where he lived. You can see some of the original examples. Now, this seems big, but look at the cabinet behind. It's, it's not too big. It's this big. Compared to the steam engine, this is progress when you consider the ratio between the size of this thing and the amount of energy produced. Not a lot of energy, but even one HP, one and a half HP uh, can be sufficient to move a small vehicle. This is another example that was being worked on the same time and was probably completed later. This uh, is an 1860 prototype by Belgian French engineer called, called Lenoir, and even this, compared to the posters in the background, is rather small. And so, there is no automobile yet, right? We're still 25 years or so before the first prototypes of the automobile, but you see how we're making progress in that direction, because there is no way that those steam engines we saw before could be mounted on an automobile and it took more time to get to it. Now, while the internal combustion engine was being tested during the 1880s, and then automobiles were being produced from 1889 on, vehicles with electrical engines were also tested. Initially, you find prototypes made just for speed, like this one, beautiful, very science fiction, right? Uh, steampunk, almost. Uh, this was called La Jamais Contente, never happy, meaning never satisfied with speed. And as you find in here, it reached 100 kilometers per hour, the first vehicle to reach that kind of speed. Of course, you don't want to be in the place of this man. This is quite dangerous, especially driven at those 
speed. However, what we've seen so far will be the reality of the automobile between the 1890s, the 1900s, the 1910s. That is to say, initially, the market for the automobile was split three ways in terms of engines, about a third of the circulating vehicle was propelled by internal combustion engines. About a third by electrical engines. So we're trying to catch up with what was going on 120 years ago, really. 1898, 1899 already, New York had hundreds of taxis, hundreds of taxi cabs with electrical engines. And they developed a simple system that is now being experimented in Asia, not yet in here, whereby when a taxi cab was running out of charge, they would go back to their hub in Manhattan, unload the discharge batteries, load fresh batteries, and the hub would be charging the batteries instead of having to wait for 30 minutes, an hour, to recharge your, your electrical vehicle. So I was saying the fleet of cars operating found on the streets of the US in the period 1900, 1910, 1915 would be a third internal combustion, a third electricity, a third steam engines. Now, you could tell me, professor, you just told that steam engines were not practical. After actually, the automobile was invented. Engineers went back to the idea of steam engine vehicles and borrowed some of the ideas from the evolution of the car to make those steam engines smaller and more efficient. And in fact, automobiles with steam engines were produced well into the 1920s. And uh, you may know how the foremost collector and one of the experts on these vehicles is Jay Leno, the comedian, late night TV host, who has quite a few of them and takes them out routinely, although he himself has suffered a few accidents. In one case, he got burned because a steam engine vehicle he was driving caught fire. He dismounted the vehicle but before he could get away, the, the flames uh, burned his hand and, and forearm. Because clearly, you still have the impracticality of a flame underneath your vehicle, a live flame. You have a lot of pipes that with time get corroded because there is very hot water running through it through the system, and you still need, even with best the best uh, steam engines, you still need to wait a little bit. By the 1900s, the wait time was reduced to a few minutes, but you had to wait a few minutes before the steam was produced in order to get your vehicle started. And since we talked about Leonardo, since we are talking about inventions during the 19th century, don't forget that throughout the whole 19th century, while people were testing steam engine vehicles, vehicles with, electric, with electrical engines, vehicles with internal combustion engines, there were also other engineers were also working throughout this whole time on the idea of the bicycle. And the first bicycles without pedals were introduced in the early 1800s without pedals, without suspensions, then pedals were added, still no suspensions. In fact, they were often called bone shakers because you, you can imagine the effects, especially with no rubber tires before rubber tires were introduced. But by the 1880s, the bicycle was perfected. So the, really, during the 19th century, the first machine 
because in some languages, the machine was the bicycle. The machine par excellence. The first of these transportation vehicles that was perfected was the bicycle itself. By the 1880s, the bicycle was perfect, meaning that between 1886 and now, the only changes in the bicycles have been lighter metals for the chassis, better wheels, slightly better aerodynamics, and, of course, the inclusion of an electrical engine. But in terms of the invention itself, no great changes have been applied after the 1880s. So the bicycle was the first machine. Again, the bicycle is found sometimes in the lists of alleged invention by Leonardo. This comes from one of the notebooks by Leonardo. However, Leonardo never invented the bicycle. What you see in here is most probably a forgery made by a scholar. I believe that. Other scholars believe that. Uh, historians of technology. Uh, you can see how there are di two different kinds of ink, a dark ink, for the circles of the bicycle and, and some of the parts, and, and then there is a reddish, brownish uh, ink or pencil. This uh, illustration was never seen until the 1970s because it was found... Uh, a scholar, an Italian scholar, Marinoni, found that two pages of a notebook were glued together. This manuscript was in the hands of friars, belonged to a convent. He asked permission to gently open and glue the two pages. He managed to do so, and later he claimed that he had found this. With all probability, what he found was just the initial circles and some cogs for a, the beginning of an illustration because Leonardo constantly drew cogwheels and he, the scholar, made a bicycle out of it. How can we say that? Because this is a perfect bicycle. There are no other bicycles in any of the notebooks by Leonardo, in any of the documents from his era, Whereas, as I said before, we have plenty of parachutes from that era and even earlier. We have plenty of flying machines from that era. We have plenty of tanks, helicopters, etc. In this case, you find a bicycle that is the, the first and only bicycle, and it's already perfect. As I said, the first bicycles called Dreisines were without pedals. Right? You just use your feet to advance it like a scooter. And in here you find everything. You find wheels with spokes, you find pedals, you find a chain going from the pedals to the back wheel, you find the handlebar, you find the seat. So it's hard to believe that Leonardo would come up with this invention. And as I said before, the so-called automobile by Leonardo is incomplete, by this seems to be uh, the, the whole thing, but yet there are no documents talking about it, talking about Leonardo experimenting with this vehicle. Of course, even if this were to be true, you can imagine how efficient a bicycle made with wood at that time might have been, or worse, if you, if you try to make it with metal. Anyway, as I said, the consensus seemed to be this never happened. This, as I said, is a bicycle from the 1880s. This was 1886, yes? And as I said before, this is not different from the standpoint of engineering from modern bicycles. The first machine to be perfected during that time was the bicycle, the bicycle itself was connected to speed and was connected in different ways with the automobile itself. During the 1890s and 1900s, bicycle races became a phenomenon. There was a mania for these things. 
they usually raced within these kind of racetracks with turns made of wood inclined so that you could keep your speed going around. They were called velodromes. And in the US as well as Europe, thousands of people would go see the daredevils go around at very high speed. You can see that there is an insistence in this collection of, of um, illustrations on the bicycles with multiple seats called tandems, because of course, the even a tandem is still light enough and adding multiple people means adding a lot of energy produced by humans. So you can imagine how quickly these machines could go around um, so easily speeds of 30 miles, which for the, for the time uh, was considered a lot. Uh, the inclusion of this image with a woman on the bicycle is a reference to the fact that within this whole technological revolutions, women occupied a crucial place, for example, even in the use and the adoption of the automobile. There were several women pioneers in this field going around on a bicycle, being the first to go from point A to point B over a long distance with a bicycle, traveling on a bicycle uh, to various uh, tourist spots. And we know <coughs> there is plenty of evidence that by the 1900s, the chauffeurs, the automobile drivers, the, the word used even in English at that time was chauffeurs, often were people who had had a career in cycling. So the same people who made a living as professional cyclists during these races in the velodromes during the 1880s and 90s, later on when they were not young enough to be competing professionally, switched from the bicycle to the automobile, both because they were considered courageous, people who had the mindset to face the challenges of speed, and because they had some mechanical expertise, right? Because they, of course, worked on their own bicycles and later on uh, learned how to work on an automobile. Because if you bought, purchased an automobile in 1902, 1905, even 1908, chances were that within 50 to 100 miles of driving, you would have some kind of malfunction on the road. And of course, you can pay a farmer to have a horse pull your car to a garage. But often people would just open the hood, get under the car and fix the car themselves. And the same way that you were taught how to drive the automobile, and there were no schools, it was the dealerships, the companies making the cars, providing the expertise, you were also being taught as a customer how to do basic repairs and maintenance on the car, okay? Of course, from the idea of the bicycle, you get the idea of applying the internal combustion engine to something similar, but motorcycles were a bit slow to come. This is from the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Germany, but those uh, uh, were rare examples. It takes a bit to make the sh a chassis that is good enough to house an engine and, and stable enough, right? Now, when we're talking about bicycle, what's interesting to us in terms of themes is that, as we mentioned last week, how the automobiles becomes one with the driver, right? That you drive without looking at the car around you, you become one with it. This is even more true with the bicycle, right? In fact, you know how when you reach a certain speed, in order to turn the bicycle, you don't use the handlebar any longer. You just do that when the speed is very, very low. But otherwise, you just move your body in the direction of the turn, right? And 
The other thing about the bicycle that makes it similar to the experience of the automobile is that you feel the speed. Have you ever tried going down a hill at 30, 40 miles an hour? You can really, it feels much faster than any car driving down the same road at the same speed. I lived at a town that is placed at the bottom of the Tuscan Apennines and as a kid, as a teenager, I would often go with my friends up the mountains just to experience the thrill of coming down as fast as we could on roads that, were, that didn't have much traffic. Okay, this is the next presentation. The next presentation is about energy sources, right? Because that's a key topic when you talk about technologies and mobility. I've included sources, energy sources applied not only to mobility, but also to work. Because often work generated by these energy sources involves some movement, okay? And a lot of things, a lot of technologies came together in the end to produce the invention of the automobile by the 19th century. So we're going back in time. I've selected only some of the information you find on the page in the class wiki. So look at that and there you'll find more notes, you'll find links, etc. Right now I want to focus on the main thing and you don't have to remember all the details, but just to have an idea. So we are talking about the period between 3000 and 500 before the common era, right? So before the period leading to, let's say, the creation of the Roman Empire, for example. What are the main energy sources in order of priority, of relevance? The most relevant is humans, right? So pyramids were built by humans, mostly, not by animals. And humans were used to move all kinds of products. Right? Of course, you find animals of all kinds being used as energy sources. The horse is the main one because a horse is really a robust and strong animal. We've lost the sense of how strong a horse can be. We, we imagine that our big tracks uh, are, are the, the stronger, but, but in fact, two horses, six horses, uh, or, or more, can carry huge loads. Horses can travel over a long distance, can sustain a speed of five to ten miles for most of the day, etc. Water itself is an energy source. I'm not talking about the fact that you have boats on the water. I'm talking about this angle for water that around the world in ancient times, you have the realization that if you have a river or any stream of water and the current is strong enough, you can put something in the water, can be a log that you've cut, can be some pontoon or barge, and the stream itself will carry up to a certain point will carry your materials or humans down the river, okay? Fire was, of course, a source of energy. Initially, it comes mostly from burning wood. Then, of course, you have winds, but I should have added, I'll add it later, that when we're talking about ships moving on water, it's not just the wind that moves those ships, because especially for ancient times, you have humans on board those ships rowing, right? They were not good enough with winds to be completely independent. And then you also have, but this is connected to this point about the water, gravity and pressure, right? Which you can exploit to move, for example, water along an irrigation system or an aqueduct. What were the best ideas for efficiency for work or movement? 
during these ancient times. The wheel, of course, but we said, don't just think of the wheel. The wheel can be simple. It's wheel and axles, right? And of course, you are, you are the, the complete opposite of a boomer like me, but I grew up in a time when kids would still try to build their own carts to go downhill somewhere. And believe me, it's easy to find wheels, but it's harder to build the system of the axle by yourself. So you have the wheel applied to carts. The carts can become military vehicles. You have the lever. That's a great discovery. And similar machines like cranes and pulleys. And really, in terms of efficiency and energy and movement, <coughs> nothing in ancient times beats the bow and arrow. The energy, the speed of an arrow by uh, uh, expelled by a well-made bow is really incredible, right? Even a simple bow and arrow can pierce metal, for example, right? And of course, from the point of view of society as a whole and the strategic relevance of these things, clearly ships, carriages, Horses were the things that made civilizations powerful during this time. And for every period, I've added a section called known but not fully exploited. During this time, they knew about coal. They knew in some areas about oil, but couldn't really make much out of them. And by the end of this period, we know that people knew about steam and how powerful it was. They experimented with it, but only on a small scale with, with toys, lab toys. Nothing was made with it. Comes to the Romans, so moving up in time, nothing changes. Well, water is applied to water mills. The only big change. Romans perfected a lot of technologies. The pulleys, aqueducts became longer with them. Roads we became better and they built a system of roads. Biggest thing doesn't change. What did the Romans know that they couldn't exploit? They were very good with cogwheels. And talking about the Romans, so not Italy, but the Roman territory as a whole, right? So including Greece and the Middle East, part of the Middle East. So they were very good with cogwheels. They probably made some advanced machines uh, for navigation, but not, nothing in terms of actual movements. They knew about springs, didn't use them much. And by the end of the Roman Republic, they experimented with, with uh, windmills. When you move closer to our era, the early modern era, includes the end of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Then, of course, energy sources in terms of who produces the energy is just the same, right? Humans, animals, etc. Of course, horses become more important. Horses are the core of armies from that era. There is a postal system developed based on horses that is pretty efficient. Ships get bigger. Streams of water are used in multiple ways for water mills and also to move hammers uh, in blacksmiths' shops. And they come up with nowhere better ways to build these things, but these are not original. Even the Romans, the Greeks had ballistas, for example, uh, but they come up with these typical medieval, late medieval. Uh, machines, catapults. The ballista is like a crossbow with a giant arrow, right? Like a big spear. You may have seen it. I think there is one in Gladiator, if you've seen the first Gladiator. Catapults, I remember when I was at the University of Toronto for my PhD, people in archaeology built a catapult, full-scale catapult, and started testing it on a big lawn 
after half an hour they had to stop because once they learn how to use the pulleys they reached the end of the lawn and they were afraid that they would crash a car or a building they were catapulting big rocks but again you have no idea how powerful a catapult and frightening for a siege can be until you see one in real life biggest thing in the modern era of course chemical compounds you know about gunpowder which produced firearms and the most frightening weapon of the time artillery sometimes just showing cannons was enough for a place to surrender but you may not know that they use flamethrowers in the battlefield and they knew about this secret weapon called the Greek fire which was like modern napalm a compound that can burn even in the presence of water so great for naval battles and overall frightening because if you have some of it on you throwing water on you will not extinguish the flames now moving past the renaissance coming closer to the uh, see that the the watch in the back is about 22 minutes slow um, but coming closer to the industrial area era what are the energy sources for transportation and work same as before humans animals ships etc of course you have the addition of coal to use operate steam engines and then some use for oil and natural gas what's the newest tech during that era now things are going to change dramatically because you have the steam engine with the steam engine you have factories factory machines moving staff helping assisting with production gas is being used for lighting lighting and once you get lights uh, in the cities with gas an entire society a set of practices change people use their life their time differently even their the sleep changes people in the past had this biphasic sleep from what we know there are some beautiful books about this people would go to bed early then wake up wake up work or read for a few hours then go back again this all changes electricity is being applied to the telegraph and then to lighting of course you have electric batteries invented by scientists such as Alessandro Volta and they know a lot about electromagnetism and you have as we said as we saw last week trains and steamships the bicycle don't forget about that as a big tech a big change from the past the makers of changes of civilization what changes the economy or the power of a nation trains steamships assembly lines dynamite don't forget about the invention again the elements for explosives were known already in the renaissance and and but they the applications were limited now you have dynamite and nitroglycerin that can be used to dig canals or tunnels right you just uh, or for mining you, you just uh, uh, explode the rocks instead of digging there are still things that are known but not exploited for example hot air balloons were introduced in the 18th century but again they were almost like toys people would go up to see the landscape some military applications were tried since the time of napoleon but mostly to observe the enemy later they introduced the rigibles and some transportation took place right you know how well into the 1930s dirigibles came from Europe to the US with a famous accident in New Jersey artillery became mobile machine guns uh, uh, were tested even in the Civil War but they were not perfected until World War I some crude automata or robots were made in the 19th century like only a small number of unique prototypes and submarines 
right? Experimented with, used in the Civil War, but you have to really wait until the 1910s to have fleet of submarines. And you know how on Long Island, if you go to New Suffolk, has anyone been there, the North Fork, near Matitok, that was the place of the first fleet of submarines operated by the US Navy, even though they were not the first units. However, when we think of mobility, and I'm coming to the end of this presentation, when we think of mobility, we have a lot of misconceptions because we don't see horses anymore. But they were there. As a kid, I was born in 1963, I still saw horses pulling carriages, bringing stuff from the countryside in my hometown. Of course, there were a small, a very small percentage of the traffic, but they were still there. They were still around. Now you see them often around Central Park, right? So <coughs> I included this slide just to remind you how, for example, sailboats were massively used around the world to carry supplies into the 1910s. So 100 years after steamships were introduced, People were still finding the use of sailboats efficient and economically profitable. If you take this area, the northeast, the northeastern seaboard, people were going out with big sailboats commercially all the time until World War I. Porters, meaning humans who as a profession carried big loads around the cities were widely used until the 1930s all over the world. Horses, horse-drawn carriages, horse-drawn barges, again, you have no idea of the power of a horse until you see, uh, I was reading a French book by Georges Simenon from the 1920s, where the murder is set on a barge and that barge is bringing supplies from Paris all the way to the Mediterranean Sea because there were rivers and canals and you could navigate from Paris all the way up in northern France practically to the Côte d'Azur, to Nice, etc. And the barge described in the book, the author has some experience because he himself uh, traveled a lot with a private yacht not just at sea, but in the rivers as well. In the story, the barge is carrying a few tons of coal and two horses. So at night, they stop. The horses stay within the boat, where they're also fed with hay. In the morning, early in the morning, the horses are taken to one per side of the river, Right On this small river or canal, the horses are placed on opposite sides with ropes connected to the barge. And the horses go move and pull a barge with a few tons of coal. Two horses is all you need. Because, of course, the barge is floating on the river. There is very little friction and two horses are enough. So a very efficient system. Horses were used massively into the 1940s. World War II, a lot of the armies fighting in World War II, the Polish army, the Russian army, the German army, the Italian army especially, used, relied a lot on horses. Even the German army, which introduced to the world the, uh, the, the advantage of mobilizing troops with vehicles, especially armored vehicles, even the German army until 1942, half of the supplies and soldiers were moving on horses and carriages. And again, we don't get that because you go, even when you go see a film on World War II, you don't see a lot of horses there, simply because you don't want to have horses on a set. Uh, they're difficult. They're difficult in an environment with too much, too many stimuli, with noises and lights, etc. 
Steam trains, steam boats were used until the 1950s. Bicycles were the primary means of transportation for millions of people around the world, well into the 1960s. So don't think that the automobile comes and everything disappears from one day to the next. And initially, of course, horses and cars share the road. And you see in the books with the accounts of trials, you see a lot of trials involving accidents with cars and horses, right? Trying to find who's at fault. Finally, at the end of the presentation, you find this section where I'm trying to list all the elements, all the separate modules and inventions that had, or discoveries that had to happen for the automobile to be realized. And, and then you understand how difficult it was to come up with a working automobile. Of course, you need to be able to refine oil to produce benzene or gasoline. Initially, it was benzene. It was much closer to alcohol, a purer form uh, compared to what we use today because you need to have a lot of energy developed from the firing of the benzene inside the engine, right? Those engines were not so efficient. So the better, the more pure the uh, fuel, the more energy you get. Of course, we mentioned how some of the cars use steam. A lot of the cars use electricity. In the 1920s, both industries, electrical cars and steam cars, declined. But it was partly due to problems with the operation of these vehicles. By the 1920s, electrical cars suffered from lack of range already. Steam engines, steam cars were difficult to operate. But it wasn't just that. It was also the fact that the rest of the industry, the automobile industry, was good enough to uh, beat the competition and make so that they would disappear, right? And you know how this happens, especially in American society. You need, since you have lights, you need to have something to produce light. Initially, it was oil, gas, then later on was electricity. You need to control the explosion of the gasoline inside the engine, right? So you need metallurgy that will give you ways to have a small explosion without the car, the engine falling apart. You need electromagnetism because you have spark plugs. Initially, you had magnetos which can be very fussy, and uh, you need electricity later for the lights. You need to have springs for the suspensions. You need to have different kinds of levers, right, to operate. Initially, cars did not accelerate with a pedal. They had on the steering wheel a lever to regulate the speed. And if you look at a car from the 1900s, in fact, you had all sorts of levers operating different parts of the engine. You need to have cogwheels, of course, inside the engine. You need to have pumps. And initially, cars had some manual pumps. The reason why race cars in the early 1900s and 1910s had a crew of two people was that there was a mechanic on board who was pumping oil and gasoline manually. You need to have rubber, of course. Initially, they used wooden wheels, but rubber presents an advantage. Initially, it was natural rubber from South America and different places. Then it became synthetic. You need to be able to cool the engine, to distribute liquids, meaning, for example, the oil for lubrication it needs to go everywhere. You need to pressurize the system. You need to have air into the system. You need to think of aerodynamics. And of course, initially you have a dirt road, but it doesn't really work that well for fast cars. 
So they develop macadam and then asphalt for the roads. You need to have a system and infrastructure of gas station. You need to have road signs. And then you need to have traffic rules right away. Who goes first at an intersection? Which side of the road are you supposed to drive? And people, now you think just of England and South Africa and few other places driving on the other side of the road. But initially, not only it changed from nation to nation, but it changed within a nation. For example, in Italy, the right side of the road would change going from Naples to Milan several times. So you had to be careful when you went into a town or a region, you had to be aware of which side was the right side for that place. And then, of course, you have fines. You need to have rules for parking. You need to have driver's licenses, etc. Any questions before we say goodbye to each other? Any comments? Okay.